Hello everybody, my name is David Gully and I'm at Bentley University and this is the third of four videos on the reserves market. And in our first two videos we looked at the standard reserves market pre-2008 and then we looked at how the Fed used to change the federal funds rate. Now we want to look at how the introduction of the IOR and ONRP facilities have affected the reserves market. In a later video, in video 4, we'll look at how we use those new facilities to change the federal funds rate. And for other videos, please see our YouTube channel. So let's think first how things used to be. So until 2008, the reserves market was a pretty standard supply and demand framework where the, they worked together to determine the equilibrium federal funds rate. And what the Fed would do is on a day-to-day -day basis or on a larger policy change basis would intervene in that market by buying and selling treasury securities to either cause the federal funds rate to not change due to other factors or for policy uh, actions to cause the federal funds rate to either rise or fall. And so what we would get here if the Fed wanted to increase uh, the federal funds rate, they would tend to reduce the supply of reserves by open market treasury sales, and so the supply curve would tend to shift back like so. If they wanted the federal funds rate to fall, they would make open market buys of treasury securities, and the federal funds rate would tend to fall because the supply of reserves curve tended to increase. And so that was how the Fed used to do things in the days of old. Now, there's a problem, at least in this sense. Uh, thanks to three quantitative easing programs, through which the Fed bought long-term treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities, that shifted the supply of reserves curve very, very far to the right by billions and billions of dollars. And so what would happen under normal circumstances if the Fed didn't do anything about that, the federal funds rate would tend to move to zero or possibly even into negative territory simply because the supply shifted so far to the right. And the Fed wanted to avoid this possibility. They wanted to maintain low but positive interest rates. And so here's what the QE programs did to the Fed's balance sheet. Now, this is not to scale, of course. These are just small examples. And so when they would buy, for example, a $20,000 Treasury note, that this would show up on its balance sheet on the asset side. And to pay for that Treasury note, the Fed would credit bank's reserves account by $20,000, supposing, for example, they bought uh, this Treasury note from a commercial bank. If they bought a $10,000 mortgage-backed security, likewise, that would show up on the balance sheet as well. They would also have to pay for this, and they would credit bank reserves account by $10,000. So notice here that QE programs tend to increase the value of the, both the Fed's assets and their liabilities, but on the liability side, the reserves increase just like they did with standard open market operations back in the day when the Fed just used Treasury bills. And so how do they avoid the problem of... Uh, a giant increase in the supply of reserves, pushing the federal funds rate down to zero or even below. Well, in October 2008, uh, the Fed started to pay interest rate, uh, pay an interest rate on reserves that were held with the Fed. Before then, the Fed didn't pay any interest on reserves. And not surprisingly, because the Fed didn't pay any interest on reserves, banks worked very hard to keep excess reserves, reserves they aren't required to hold, to an absolute minimum. And so what they did is, after a little introductory period where they changed it around a little bit, the Fed uh, settled on paying a quarter percent interest, or in other words, 25 basis points, uh, on both required and excess reserves. And as a little note here, the Fed is allowed to pay different interest rates on required versus excess reserves if it so chooses. So how does interest on reserves work? Well, if the Fed sets interest on reserves above zero, this will help keep the federal funds rate from falling to below zero. And the reason for this is the interest on reserves, in other words, IOR for short, acts as kind of a floor for short-term interest rates in general. And how does this happen? Well, when the Fed started paying interest on reserves, what they did is they effectively created a brand new overnight risk-free asset that banks could hold. And this risk-free asset would compete with other short-term interest rates such as um, uh, uh, commercial paper, uh, certificates of deposits, and so forth. And so this competition from the interest on reserve rate helped elevate short-term interest rates above zero, even though it wasn't by very much. It was still somewhat effective, however. And so visually, what happened here is this. The uh, increase in the supply of reserves caused by quantitative easing 
shifted the supply of reserves curve very far to the right, well beyond the standard downward sloping part of the demand curve. And if the interest on reserves didn't exist, what would eventually happen is that it is possible that the federal funds rate could have pushed to zero or even possibly negative. Now, by introducing interest on reserves, the Fed added a little twist to an already interesting uh, looking demand curve. So the demand curve previous to interest on reserves had a perfectly vertical component, had a standard downward sloping component, and now it has a perfectly elastic component. So this new component here is created by the fact the Fed pays interest on reserves. And so initially, when the Fed introduced this, it was at 0.25%. And this acts as kind of a, a floor, kind of a soft floor, but a floor nonetheless for the federal funds rate. And so what you have now is a new intersection of the supply and demand, and this would help keep the federal funds rate from falling to zero or even below. But we've got a problem still. Here's the problem. According to the previous graph, the intersection of supply and demand should say that the federal funds rate ought to be about 0.25%. But the problem is that it actually wasn't 0.25%. And the reason for this is that only banks can um, claim interest on reserves. And so the Fed would pay the 0.25% on reserves deposited with the Fed. And that was only available to banks. Non-banks didn't have that opportunity. And so this is why other short-term interest rates tended to fall below that quarter percent. And this is why, for example, the Fed, instead of having a target value of the federal funds rate like they used to, adopted a target range, for example, you know, their initial zero to a quarter percent. So what to do? How to solve this problem? Well, they introduce a new financial asset. This is the overnight reverse repurchase agreement here. So the so notice I've got the letters capitalized here in terms of the um, the shorthand. So it's the overnight reverse repurchase uh, program. This is where non banks can lend money to the Fed and they can earn whatever the ONRRP rate is. And so effectively what the Fed has done now is they've introduced two new short-term interest rates. Interest on reserves, that's payable to banks, and the ONRRP rate, which is payable to non-banks. And so in terms of the Fed's balance sheet, it was a very simple uh, setup, is once they introduced the ONRRP facility, um, non-banks could take advantage of this, and what would happen, for example, is if a non-bank, an investment bank or a pension fund or some other, some other similar uh, company wanted to, uh, to uh, acquire this short-term asset, they would simply um, do so. And so this would show up as a liability to the Fed. So they would loan money to the Fed. And once these, this organization loaned money to the Fed, that becomes a liability to the Fed. And what this would do on the offsetting uh, part of the Fed's balance sheet is it would reduce reserves by $20,000 within the banking system. So in effect, there was a, a, a liability swap uh, for the Fed. They would reduce reserves by, say, $20,000, and they would increase the ONRRP holdings by $20,000. So the net effect on the Fed's balance sheet was zero in terms of size, but there was a change in composition, and that's the important thing here. Now, quick summary. Um, quantitative, quantitative easing dramatically increased the supply of reserves. It shifted the reserves curve, in other words, very far to the right. And this would have caused the federal funds rate to, sh to be pushed down to zero or possibly even below. And so what the Fed did in response is they began paying interest on reserves, and then they also introduced the ONRRP facility for non-banks. And the structure is set up so that the IOR rate is currently set above the ONRRP rate, so there's, there's a little corridor there. Other short-term interest rates are going to be pulled into this range through competition. So effectively what's going on is the Fed is offering these two interest rates, the IOR and the ONRP rate, and so other short-term interest rates will tend to migrate to around that range there. And overall, it's been relatively effective. Thank you all very much.